Welcome to another lecture from Data Formats. Today, we are going to talk about multimedia formats and I am going to give you an overview uh, of um, what the multimedia formats are based on and uh, give you some examples. We'll start with uh, graphic formats. And uh, when we talk about graphics, there are two um, fundamentally different approaches to um, representation of graphics in computers. What you can see in the slide are two perfectly equal uh, number eights. However, one is represented as raster graphics and one is represented as vector graphics. Uh, raster graphics is sometimes also called uh, bitmap graphics. And uh, even though uh, those two number eights uh, look uh, fairly similar uh, right now, um, they are indistinguishable. Uh, they remain indistinguishable only when the raster or bitmap uh, version is rendered precisely at the resolution of the media. In our case, uh, display, or if you were to print the slide, um, than uh, the print. When you zoom in, uh, the situation becomes uh, different and it is quite obvious that um, there is a difference. Uh, while the raster graphics mm, looks not detailed and jagged and uh, all that when zoomed in, um, the vector graphics looks uh, quite natural and um, quite, uh, quite nice. It's rendered in, again, the native resolution of, uh, of the display. That doesn't mean that uh, raster graphics doesn't have its use cases. It does, and so does uh, the vector graphics. It's just important to know the difference and uh, to know uh, in which use case to use what. There is one uh, case when uh, raster graphics can be uh, resized and still look good. And that is when it is shrinked uh, and uh, the bitmap has uh, n times higher resolution than the display or, or print and uh, n is a natural number. Then, for instance, four pixels get shrunk into one or nine into one. And uh, in that case, um, even, even uh, bitmap graphics when resized looks okay, uh, but that is the, the, the only case basically. And uh, when you choose poorly, uh, like in this case, uh, here, the author, and uh, yes, it was me uh, when I was writing my uh, master's thesis, um, the author chose to represent uh, this diagram in, uh, in a raster graphics. And then uh, when the diagram got uh, zoomed in, um, it uh, looks terrible, uh, especially when you compare it to uh, the label of the figure um, <clears throat> below the diagram, which uh, looks completely normal. And all the text and all the edges uh, are blurred and uh, this is all wrong. This is exactly uh, where the author should uh, have chosen uh, vector graphics and not uh, raster graphics. So the difference between vector graphics and raster graphics is that uh, raster graphics um, says uh, how each individual um, piece of the image called pixel looks like, what is its color, maybe transparency. However, uh, in vector graphics, uh, you represent the image using points and lines and uh, shapes, uh, which get interpreted uh, for every device um, separately, for every resolution separately, and uh, it always gets computed correctly for each uh, resolution. Raster graphics, uh, you, can, you can zoom in or you can zoom out. However, uh, it will never look as nice as, uh, as vector graphics. And uh, we'll start with uh, vector graphics formats. So when we talk about vector graphics, um, I will talk about 2D graphics in this lecture mostly. Uh, we are talking about graphics that uh, you can compose out of points, paths and text. And paths can be of different types, lines, curves, even polygons. And uh, when talking about those, uh, you can say that the uh, um, polygon, for instance, has a fill 
uh, type and fill color. Um, the stroke uh, refers to the border of the shape and each shape has a color. And when you describe it like this, uh, you can then render such a shape in any resolution. The same goes for text. Um, you say which font to use and which color. And again, you can zoom in, zoom out and um, the, the font or the text will get rendered correctly in, in any resolution. The data format, uh, which um, is open and standardized and uh, endorsed on the web, is uh, one which we already have seen when uh, we talked about uh, specific XML data formats. In this case, it is SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics. So as, uh, as the example suggests, SVG is an XML-based uh, format. It's a text-based XML-based format. Um, with a vocabulary that um, uh, supports vector graphics. In the example here, we can see a very simple example where we have one polygon with three points, uh, also known as a triangle. And uh, we style this triangle. Uh, we set uh, the fill to lime, the stroke to purple, and stroke width to one. And the result you can see there. Um, <clears throat> The SVG format is a W3C recommendation, which means it is a web standard. It is supported by all major web browsers. And uh, if you are going to uh, use vector graphics, I suggest you, um, you represent it in SVG. The SVG specification is quite complex. Uh, we won't go into details. Uh, I'll just give you a few examples and later uh, if uh, you are interested or you'll come across the need to represent vector graphics, um, you can uh, follow the, uh, the complete SVG specification. But here I'll just give you another simple example. In this case, we have uh, five rectangles, four inside uh, the fifth one. And um, as you can see in the SVG, there are five rectangle uh, XML elements with different definitions. Um, there is um, X and Y attributes suggesting where the rectangle starts. There is width and height suggesting the dimensions. And um, then some of the rectangles have a stroke um, specified and some of them have fill specified. The special one, the fifth one that encompasses all uh, the, the four other ones uh, has fill set to none, which means it's transparent. And uh, the result when rendered, for instance, in a web browser or an SVG editor, you can see, uh, you can see in the slide. There is uh, one definite advantage to SVG since it is XML based, it can be embedded in HTML. So uh, when you have your SVG file, you can either uh, link it using the typical IMG um, HTML element, or you can embed it into the HTML document directly, uh, potentially saving, for instance, some HTTP requests um, by embedding the SVG directly into the HTML uh, code. There is another advantage that comes um, out of this or that's applicable to SVG, and that is that you can style it with CSS, cascading, cascading style sheets. The same language you use to style your HTML web pages, you can use to style uh, SVG um, things. Uh, like uh, here, we have the circle from, uh, from uh, the last example, and we, on top of that, style it using CSS so that the fill is red and the stroke is blue, and you can see the result again in, um, in a browser window. So this is quite advantageous, um, and uh, SVG is used for vector graphics all over the web. Um, more uh, use cases for SVG or uh, vector graphics in general are uh, definitely diagrams. So whenever you uh, draw something like UML class diagrams or any other diagrams, definitely uh, use vector graphics when you embed this into text or uh, into web pages. The same goes for slide graphics, uh, for plot charts or for engineering plans. Um, Especially for the engineering plans, imagine that you want to see more detail. You buy a brand new 8K television 
and you displayed those engineering plans on it and uh, now you realize that uh, the author uh, actually did um, a screenshot or a bitmap based uh, export in low resolution and uh, you still see nothing or, or everything is blurry that's uh, not a good thing so uh, for stuff like plans and diagrams definitely use uh, use vector graphics and um, vector graphics doesn't have to be simple as uh, the uh, the examples that you are seeing right now for instance this is also a svg uh, file with vector graphics even though it uh, looks almost photorealistic um, there is a link in the slides so if you are interested uh, in seeing how such an svg file looks like it is quite big it has 185 kilobytes um, you can take a look and uh, maybe try to open it in um, svg editor there is um, one use case that I didn't mention yet, and that is interactive visualizations uh, on the web. And there is a whole library called D3JS, which uses JavaScript to actually generate and manipulate SVG graphics uh, in a web browser. And it is used for visualizations of data of many, many types. So take a look there. And uh, here is one example. Uh, which is a pie chart um, visualization and um, there is um, the developer console in your browser visible and you can see that <clears throat> actually this uh, pie chart is represented as SVG graphics in the web browser. Um, now, um, if you want to create vector graphics, you have of course multiple choices. Um, something simple can be written by hand in Notepad or Visual Studio Code or something like that. Um, but if you want something more complex, uh, you want to use a proper editor. And uh, a free and open source one is uh, Inkscape, which I recommend. Um, then uh, many editors where you, where you can uh, draw uh, drawings such as uh, Google Slides. Uh, or Google Drawings allow you to export SVG files. So when you uh, send those drawings to someone, as for instance you did with uh, the homework, um, you can uh, you can export the graphics not as a bitmap but as vector graphics in SVG uh, with all the advantages it has. Um, the free and open source editors are not the only choice. Uh, there are commercial alternatives such as Adobe Illustrator or Corel Draw or many more if, um, if uh, you are into, uh, into such a thing. But I recommend uh, trying to use the free and open source Inkscape. Okay, so so far uh, I have shown you 2D uh, vector graphics. Uh, but of course you can go 3D and for 3D there is the Universal 3D data format standardized by ECMA in 2005 and um, uh, drawings or uh, renderings in, in this format uh, can be later embedded in PDF files and those PDF files are then called PDF3D but it uh, is uh, not anything special, it's just a PDF file which we will talk about at the end of this lecture and uh, when uh, Universal 3D uh, format is embedded into this PDF file you'll get a PDF 3D Okay, so that was a short overview of uh, vector graphics, what you can expect and um, introduction to the SVG data format that uh, you should use uh, for vector graphics exchange. Let's now move on to raster or bitmap graphics. As I said uh, earlier, raster or bitmap uh, graphic formats are all based on uh, pixels. A pixel is a square of color. And raster graphics is typically viewed as a matrix of pixels or matrix or dots. Um, when we talk about pixels, we typically talk about digital displays. When we talk about dots, we typically talk about uh, printers. Uh, and um, one of the most important properties of uh, raster graphics is uh, resolution. Uh, also known as the size of uh, the pixel or dot matrix. Uh, it is simply a number of columns and number of rows. For instance, 
the, the two examples correspond to 4K and 8K resolutions of uh, modern TVs. And um, there is yet another a more imprecise way of um, specifying resolution, and that is uh, by using the total number of pixels, uh, which you get uh, if you multiply the number of columns and the number of rows. So if you see resolution uh, in, in megapixels, for instance, uh, and here we have the 4K resolution, um, which is roughly 8 megapixels, and the 8K resolution, which is roughly 32 megapixels, uh, you get the total number of pixels, uh, but uh, you uh, cannot determine the exact number of columns and rows from that. Um, so the more precise way of specifying resolution is the number of columns and number of rows. Now, if uh, we are talking about uh, columns and rows and, uh, and pixels, um, that is um, um, that does not correlate with uh, real world directly. So in real world, when we want to display dots or pixels, the dots and uh, the pixels have to have some real world size. For instance, uh, on your digital display, a pixel has a certain size. Uh, and uh, when you print a dot using a printer, that dot also has a certain size and you can fit a certain number of dots or pixels into a real world um, uh, measure of, uh, of distance. Uh, and there uh, we need to specify or we, we talk about dot or pixel density. Uh, again, when we um, talk about pixel density, uh, we talk about pixels per inch typically, and this is a property of digital displays. Whereas when we talk about dot per inch DPI, uh, we are typically talking about printers. Now, um, when we are done talking about uh, resolution and uh, pixel dot density, uh, we need to talk about uh, the pixel, which is a square of color. So we need to talk about color. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, raster graphics differs uh, very much according to what um, sets of colors uh, it supports. So the most basic one is uh, monochrome, which basically supports just black and white uh, graphics. So each pixel is either black or white, and uh, based on that, monochrome graphics uh, gets um, represented. When we extend on this, uh, we talk about uh, grayscale graphics, when we have a whole scale between white and black, uh, all shades of gray, um, typically 256, but that can vary. Um, so when we have all those shades, we talk about grayscale graphics. Um, another option that we have is a palletized color. Palletized color is an interesting concept where we have a limited set of colors, for instance, 16 colors. But um, for each image, that set of colors may differ. And um, for instance, later we'll see a graphic format uh, where we can choose a certain number of colors uh, for each uh, image represented using that format. And each color may be chosen from uh, um, 16 million colors. So uh, we pick, for instance, 16 colors out of all of those for each image. So uh, the image itself has, uh, has a, only a very limited number of colors, but those colors are not predefined. They can be chosen. So this is called palletized uh, raster graphics. And of course, the most common one nowadays is full color graphics, where we can, um, we can choose any color from a certain color model. And this brings us to the term color model. A color model is a, an abstract a mathematical representation of, uh, of, of color. And the most common one is the RGB color model, which, um, as you probably already know, um, consists of uh, three uh, light sources. One is red, one is green, one is blue. Uh, and for each light source, uh, we specify the intensity of, uh, of such a light source. Um, this color model is uh, often enough uh, called additive because it, it represents how much of each uh, light source should shine uh, 
uh, to get the desired color. And um, the color here is then represented by three numbers, one for red, one for green and one for blue. And the number represents how much that particular uh, color should shine um, to get the resulting color. And it is called additive because um, <clears throat> the higher the number, the lighter uh, the color, because it means the more light uh, gets, uh, gets uh, into the color. On the other hand is the CMYK uh, color model, uh, which is um, on the other hand called subtractive, because this one is uh, most commonly used with printers. Uh, and uh, it is based on the cyan, magenta, yellow and black colors. And again, uh, those are four numbers and each color is represented by those four numbers. And uh, the higher the number means more ink should be applied um, to uh, the printed dot. And uh, that's why this color model is often enough uh, referred to as subtractive, uh, because the more ink you get um, into the dot, uh, the less light gets reflected and the darker the color is. So RGB used mainly for, uh, for digital displays says how much uh, light of each color should be applied uh, and uh, the subtractive CMYK um, mod color model uh, says how much ink should be applied and therefore more ink means less, uh, less light. So two basic color models. And uh, now the color models are something again abstract because uh, it is unclear uh, to, for instance, to which wavelength a certain combination of RGB or CMYK should, uh, should refer to. And that is where we get to um, a color space. What you see is a chromaticity diagram which represents uh, the set of color visible um, by a standard human eye. So all these colors are visible by a standard human, uh, human eye. Uh, and uh, on this chromaticity diagram, when we define a, uh, uh, an area such as, such as these, uh, we basically define a color space, which is a set of colors which are achievable um, within that color space. And uh, why those color spaces are different is because uh, the color space has standardized hues of uh, primary colors. So for instance, the RGB uh, based color spaces have standardized wavelength of the red and the green and the blue um, light source. And um, those three standardized hues then uh, define the color space and uh, what colors are achievable. And there are different color spaces defined. Uh, for instance, um, the sRGB color space, uh, standard red, green, blue, is defined to be used uh, on the internet and uh, for digital displays. Whereas uh, the Adobe RGB color space is defined to encompass all the colors achievable by CMYK based printers. However, uh, this color space is defined using RGB so that uh, you, can, uh, you can see what uh, your printed out graphics will look like on a digital display. And um, since uh, we have the color model, which is the abstract mathematical um, well, uh, construct, and then we have the defined color space with the uh, primaries defined as particular wavelengths, um, there has to be a mapping from the color model or the combinations of RGB, for instance, uh, to the real world colors uh, achievable in uh, a specific color space. So a color space has the standardized wavelength of, uh, of, the, of the primaries and then there is a mapping function from uh, a color model to this particular color space. Um, and uh, there are many, many color spaces. Uh, I have already talked about sRGB and Adobe RGB. Um, nowadays, if uh, you uh, if you see, for instance, reviews of uh, 4K TVs or 8K TVs, you might come across the DCI-P3 color space or Rec 2020 color space. Uh, and then uh, 
uh, what we talk about is gamut. Gamut is uh, basically all the colors achievable by a display device. And the gamut can be also represented by a percentage of coverage of a certain color space. So the color space is a predefined set of colors and then a device such as a TV or a monitor has gamut, which is basically uh, a subset of a color space. And this gamut uh, then covers certain percentage of a color space. Okay, so uh, this is color models and color spaces. Uh, now, we are still going to talk about uh, the numbers of colors achievable. Um, and uh, we will talk about bit depth, which means how many bits uh, are used uh, to represent a color of a certain pixel. Now, when we have uh, one bit per pixel, uh, we can be quite certain that the pixel is either black or white. If we have two bits per pixel, we already have four colors to choose from, and so on and so forth. Uh, the most common, uh, the most common uh, bit depth uh, nowadays is 24 bits per pixel, which means 16 million colors, also called as true color. And this means that for uh, each of the uh, primaries, red, green, and blue, we have eight bits, which means uh, the standard um, the standard scale, where for uh, red, we have zero to 255 steps, for green the same, and for blue the same. So that is 24 bit, uh, bits per pixel, eight bits per color. Uh, now you can see in the examples, uh, what is the difference uh, between um, between 8 bits per pixel, 16 bits per pixel, and 24 bits per pixel. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, sometimes um, we can see uh, we can see a correlation between gamut and uh, the colors needed, uh, or, or the bits per pixel needed to cover that gamut. Uh, if we think about gamut as uh, basically the number of uh, colors. Uh, displayable by a device and uh, we already know that there is a mapping from the color model uh, for instance from RGB uh, to this uh, to this, to this uh, color space or gamut it is quite clear that the wider the gamut the more colors uh, we actually are uh, or uh, the number of colors that we want to show um, more bits per pixel we need um, to distinguish them. Otherwise, uh, the difference between two neighboring colors will be too big and uh, uh, the result will look like uh, the 8 bits per pixel example uh, that we have here. That is why, for instance, nowadays when, uh, when you have uh, wide gamut TVs, um, you also need at least 10 bits per pixel um, so that the colors of the wide gamut um, are, uh, are nice and, uh, and there is not much difference uh, between two neighboring colors. Um, right. Uh, what can happen is uh, that uh, your color model uh, does not only contain RGB, red, green and blue, but it may also contain transparency. In that case, we are talking about RGBA. And basically what happens is that there is another channel called alpha channel. Uh, and uh, this means additional 8, 10 or 12 bits per pixel, uh, which say how much transparency uh, a certain pixel has. And uh, the difference in uh, size of image is quite considerable. For instance, if you have uh, 8 bits per color, which means 24 bits per pixel, uh, a typical 12 megapixel image uh, takes about 36 megabytes. If you add transparency, you are suddenly at, uh, at 48 megabytes. Uh, now, I will talk about one technique called dithering, which helps you to achieve colors which you could not achieve otherwise. Um, this is a technique typically used by printers, but it can also be used by digital displays. And basically, it means um, that um, uh, you reduce resolution by displaying different colors uh, in neighboring pixels, and uh, when uh, this, these neighboring colors uh, or, or the pixels are small enough, um, it seems that uh, the color uh, is uh, the average 
of those two, two colors. For instance, here in the color example, we can see that uh, we use red and blue pixels. And um, as the pixel density increases, more and more the color looks like purple, which is not the color that we had available. We had only red and blue in the beginning. And the same uh, gets used with monochrome graphics, where in the example that you see, um, basically the density of, uh, of black dots, and we have only white and black dots, the density of black dots um, defines um, the shades of gray that, uh, that you can see. If you view this image from uh, far, far enough, or if you zoom out enough, uh, you will basically see a grayscale image. But of course, this is at the cost of uh, effective resolution. Talking about printers, uh, dithering takes place uh, uh, when when you are printing uh, color graphics, uh, for instance, on your on your ink um, printer or laser printer. And uh, basically, if your printer says that it can print 4,800 dots per inch, and it has four four primary colors, um, it basically means it is able to uh, print um, 1200 dpi images because the four times higher resolution gets uh, oh, well reduced by dithering. There is another uh, type of dithering which is called temporal dithering and uh, the effect is the same. However, it works in a different way. It is not the neighboring pixels that get uh, different colors. It is the same pixel that uh, gets different colors in time, which basically means that uh, if uh, we again had uh, red and blue and wanted to achieve uh, purple, we could do that by uh, switching the color of the pixel between red and blue uh, very fast in time. And um, to the human eye, this pixel would, uh, would seem purple. Um, so this dithering is at the cost of uh, refresh frequency. Uh, whereas re uh, regular spatial dithering is um, at the cost of effective resolution. Okay, so uh, this was a short introduction to the basic properties of raster or bitmap graphics. Now let's take a look at uh, how such graphics can be represented in a file. And we'll start with something very simple, which is a BMP file or also called uh, DIB, uh, Device Independent Bitmap. Now, this file has, of course, some header saying what's the resolution of the file and so on. Uh, and then uh, the main part of the file is a pixel array, which is the bitmap data itself. And uh, in the table, you can see the representation of the image that you can see in the slide. Um, note that uh, this div is bottom up. So we start with the lower left corner, which is the red pixel. And also uh, the byte order of, of the individual colors is blue, green, red, not red, green, blue. That's just how it is in, uh, in a div. So the first pixel is the lower left pixel. And in the order blue, green, red, we can see that we have 0, 0 and 255, which makes this pixel red. Then we have another pixel, which is white. Um, there we see that it's 255, 255, 255. Uh, and we get a white pixel. And then there is padding so that uh, uh, so that uh, the uh, the rows are aligned to uh, to four bytes. And then the the first row starts with a blue pixel and a green pixel and again a padding. So like this, uh, you can simply represent a bitmap uh, which, when large enough, uh, can represent a a, a nice image or picture. There is one clear disadvantage to representing uh, images, raster images like this. And that is, of course, the size. Because here we use 8 bits per color, which means um, 24 bits uh, per pixel plus the alignment. Um, and uh, this uh, yields up to oh, a little bit more than 36 megabytes per a 12 megapixel image, which is quite a lot. Uh, so um, something should be done about this because this representation is really inefficient. It's quite simple, so it is easy to process, easy to save, 
but it is spatially inefficient. The files are too large, especially if you imagine that you would represent uh, graphics for uh, in a video like this. So what we need to do is we need to talk about compression and we'll start with uh, talking about some uh, compression techniques and we'll start with lossless compression. And the first technique I'll show you is run length coding. If you uh, imagine an image like this with four colors, A, B, C, D, um, you already know how to represent this image in a DIB or BMP file. However, it could be, uh, it could be represented in a more efficient way. Uh, and uh, the more efficient way uh, uses uh, what is called a run, which is basically more pixels of the same color one after each other. And uh, for instance, here you can see that there are four red pixels, then two green pixels, three uh, blue pixels, and then one red pixel on the first row. And um, maybe this could be represented in a more efficient way than just saying first pixel is red, second pixel is red, third pixel is red. We could say that first four pixels are red, then two pixels are blue, uh, green, sorry, three pixels are blue, and one pixel is again red. And then for the second row, we could say three pixels are red, four pixels are green, two pixels are blue, and one pixel is yellow, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, run length coding. And if you have your runs long enough, you will save uh, space and uh, this compression is lossless. You won't lose any information, just the encoding of the information is uh, more efficient. Now there is another uh, way of doing this and uh, that is that uh, you specify the end index of a certain color. So here we specify that uh, color A, which is red, ends at uh, pixel 4 and then uh, green, which B, uh, ends at pixel 6, then blue, which is C, ends at pixel 9 and uh, again red ends at pixel 10. So this is another way of encoding the same thing. Now. Uh, if you take a closer look at this image, you'll see that uh, maybe uh, we could take advantage of the, th uh, of the fact that uh, we know the resolution uh, of uh, the image, so we know how many columns are there, and therefore we do not have to split the runs according to rows. So what we could achieve is that the red pixel, which is at the end of the first row, could be added to the run which starts at the second row. And um, again, given that we know the resolution and we know where to split the rows, we could encode the same thing like this without the row numbers. So four pixels are red, two pixels are green, three pixels are blue, and then four pixels are red, which is the one at the end of the first row and the th three at the beginning of the second row. So this is uh, one of the techniques that is used uh, for lossless compression. Now we could extend this technique to two dimensions uh, and uh, then we would be talking about blockwise coding. With blockwise coding, we basically say, okay, so uh, in the first row, in the first column, there is a block, a square block of size four and uh, it is green. Then in the fifth column of the first row, there is a block size of red color and uh, it is of size one. And the same goes for column six, seven, and eight. Then we start the second row and uh, there is the first block still. And then we continue with uh, the fifth column, sixth column, and so on with uh, color C. So if we have enough, uh, enough blocks like this, um, we can again save some uh, data compared to the run length uh, encoding. And it is just an extension of the same technique into uh, two dimensions. Um, there is yet another way of representing this or looking at this problem. And uh, this is called a quad tree coding. Uh, basically what this does is that it splits the image into four quadrants. And uh, if one of the quadrants is all of the same color, it gets represented uh, using that color. If it is, um, this is the case with the first and the third quadrant here, the green and the red one. Um, if the quadrant is not all of the same color, it gets split again into four quadrants. And um, 
this recursively until you get quadrants of size one, which are uh, by definition all of the same color. Uh, and uh, those get represented by the color. And if you uh, look at this, it is encoded as a, a tree which, uh, where each node has four children, either the color, which means there is a block of that particular size filled with this color, or there is another split into four quadrants. So this is quad tree coding. And uh, there are more methods to lossless compression. There is Huffman coding, uh, which can be applied not only to graphics, but to data in general. And basically here you do a frequency analysis of the individual colors, let's say. And uh, to the most frequent colors, you assign the shortest code. So for instance, here in the example, the most frequent color is red. So red will be encoded as a zero. The second uh, most frequent color is, uh, is green, so it will be represented as 1, 0, and uh, the least frequent will be 1, 1. Uh, when you encode the colors like this, uh, you basically save one bit on each, um, each uh, occurrence of the red color here. So that's Huffman coding. And there is another type of compression called LZ77, 77 because it was invented in 1977. It does not require the frequency analysis and basically it reads a stream of, uh, of bytes and when a repeated value is found uh, it is replaced with a reference to its previous occurrence so basically it constructs a dictionary of already seen values and uh, when this value repeats it gets replaced by a reference uh, to this already seen value so that's lz77 compression okay so uh, those were some lossless compression techniques uh, applicable to raster graphics. And uh, we have uh, our first uh, raster graphics format with uh, lossless compression, and that's uh, graphics interchange format pronounced GIF or GIF. Um, it was invented in 1987, so it's quite ancient. It uses 8 bits per pixel, and here you can have a palette of 256 colors, which correspond to 8 bits per pixel. However, you can choose for each image uh, which colors uh, the 256 will be. So it is not a fixed set of 256 colors. You can choose from the whole 24-bit RGB, uh, RGB color model, 256 colors, and then those will be used in the image. Uh, so GIF, lossless compression raster format. Uh, it also, uh, on top of the palletized color model, it uh, uses a lossless uh, LZW compression, which is similar to the uh, LZ77 uh, compression. There is one huge advantage to uh, GIF, which uh, ensured that it uh, survived quite long on the web, and that's um, the fact that it supports animation. So animated GIF uh, was very popular for simple animations uh, embedded in uh, web pages, for instance. Now, there is another lossless compression uh, raster format. Uh, both of those are historical, um, not really um, recommended to be used anymore. And the second one is PNG, Portable Network Graphics. It's from 1997 and it was uh, developed as a replacement for GIF. Uh, so it uh, supports for full color RGB or it can again be palletized. It uh, uses a different uh, type of lossless compression called deflate. It does not support animation. That's a huge disadvantage of PNG. On the other hand, it supports transparency. So uh, it was um, a, a format which you could use on the web with uh, transparent uh, areas, um, which again was uh, quite an advantage. So does not support animation, but does support transparency, PNG, another lossless compression uh, raster format. Now, uh, we need to also talk about lossy compression because uh, uh, lossless compression is nice, but uh, we still uh, need better compression ratios and um, all the compression uh, or image or raster compression techniques used both in still images and in video uh, and also in digital audio as we'll see all of those are based on discrete cosine transformation 
Now, uh, the discrete cosine transformation, DCT, is based on a simple idea. Uh, it basically transforms the image from raster representation to a so-called frequency representation. Now, what this actually means, uh, imagine this 1D uh, grayscale image example that you can see in the slide. Um, if you imagine how a standard cosine function looks like, it goes up and down and up and down and so on. Uh, now, if you imagine that the X axis is a spatial dimension, so it goes from left to right. And the y-axis, which is the value of the cosine function, uh, which goes up and down and up and down, represents uh, pixel color, uh, and in this case, grayscale pixel color. Uh, what you actually see is, a, uh, is an image generated by a cosine function, uh, because uh, the color goes from white to black to white to black and so on. So if we are talking about um, a typical cosine function, it goes from uh, negative 128 to positive 127, for instance. And we were used to seeing, um, for instance, in the RGB model or in grayscale, uh, a scale from uh, 0 to 255. Uh, we can simply shift this scale uh, to fit the uh, uh, negative and positive numbers. Uh, of the cosine function. So this is not a problem. It's shifted, but otherwise it, it holds. So uh, basically what you can see in this, uh, uh, in this uh, image is the result of a frequency representation of a simple image that goes up and down and up and down or from white to black, from white to black. Now, um, we can change, of course, the amplitude of uh, the cosine function, which means uh, that um, uh, we change uh, the range of, uh, of the color uh, it goes through. We can also change the frequency of the cosine function to generate another, uh, another type of image. Now, uh, this is all fine, uh, but um, if, we want to, uh, if we want to generate an uh, arbitrary image or actually transform an arbitrary image from its rest representation to a frequency representation, and it is not an image that looks uh, like this, um, we would have to uh, define a more complex function than, uh, than cosine. However, if we look at the frequency representation of an image like this, we are able to somehow define a function that will behave um, the way we need so that it represents um, an image. From mathematics, we know that uh, when we have a periodic function, uh, an arbitrary periodic function, we are able to represent this function as a Fourier series, uh, which is a sum of uh, sinus and cosinus functions um, series. And uh, this also applies to 2D functions. So uh, I showed you an example with 1D image, but the same goes for 2D functions and 2D images. So we are able to represent an image as a 2D function, and uh, we are able to represent that function as a Fourier series, uh, which is a sum of function series. Now, Fourier series is um, composed of sinus and cosinus. So without going into the mathematical details, uh, discrete cosine transformation basically works the same as Fourier series uh, with the ex uh, exception that it uses only cosine functions and not uh, sinus and cosine. So um, yeah, discrete cosine transformation means that we actually um, transform the raster image to um, representation using a sum of functions, and uh, we call this a frequency representation. Now, this uh, by itself is not a compression, because this is a lossless transformation, and we can do an inverse transformation and again get the original image. However, the compression uh, step uh, works in the frequency representation of, uh, of the image, and it is called quantization. And it is based on the fact that uh, uh, humans are more sensitive 
to uh, lower frequencies and less sensitive to higher frequencies. Now, higher frequencies um, correspond to big differences in uh, color in an image. So sharp edges uh, like the cat's ear, for instance, um, that corresponds to high frequencies. Um, and uh, since, the, since humans are more sensitive to lower frequencies than to higher frequencies, and we have the frequency representation of the image as a, a sum of functions, uh, we can discard the higher frequency functions and uh, save some data and uh, get an image which uh, loses some details, but uh, to humans is still okay. And uh, the more frequencies we, we discard, the higher compression level we achieve. Um, and since we lose detail, this is a lossy compression. But it is the basis of all uh, lossy compression techniques on images and videos up to date. There is another uh, technique used for lossy compression, and that's called chroma subsampling. Um, here, we'll uh, choose a different color model for the images. Uh, we won't represent the image as uh, red, green, and blue, but uh, we'll use YCVCR. It's a different color space, it's a different color model. Uh, it uh, also has three parts, but the first part, called Luma or Luminance, represents brightness of the pixel. And uh, the remaining two parts, uh, chroma, uh, chroma or chrominance parts, uh, represent uh, the blue and the red component of, uh, of the color. Uh, so again, we are able to represent many colors, but uh, the uh, individual uh, parts of the color model are different. Not red, green and blue, but uh, Y, which is Luma, and uh, then uh, the blue and red chroma uh, component. Um, and chroma subsampling is again based on the fact that the human eye is more sensitive to luma changes, which is changes in brightness, than to chroma changes, which is the changes in color. And uh, uh, chroma subsampling means that uh, we will reduce the resolution of the chroma components of uh, the image. Now, uh, the chroma subsampling is characterized by um, the three numbers, uh, J, A, and B. Um, and uh, basically what, this three, what these three numbers represent is the number of luminant and chrominant samples in a region which is J pixels wide and two pixels high. J is typically four. So those will be regions four pixels wide and two pixels high. A is the number of chroma samples in the first row of J pixels or four pixels, and B is the number of changes of chrominant samples between the first and the second row. Uh, this may be a little bit abstract, so let me illustrate. Here uh, we see um, on, the, on the top row, we see the final uh, image, which is J or four pixels wide and two pixels high. Um, and uh, this image is a result of uh, the uh, Luma uh, or Y, component and then the chroma components um, added together. And uh, in the first column, we see um, the chroma subsampling 411. This means that uh, in a region which is four pixels wide and two pixels high, there is one chroma sample in the first row and one change of this chroma sample in the second row, which basically means that we quarter the horizontal re resolution of color and we keep the full vertical resolution of color, uh, which can be seen um, on the bottom row uh, of the colors. Now, 420 means that we have half the horizontal resolution and half the vertical resolution, because in four pixels, we have two chroma samples and no changes between, uh, between rows. 422 means that we have two chroma samples per four pixels and two changes. So we have the full vertical resolution here, but we have still half horizontal resolution. 444 means that in four pixels, there are four chroma samples in the first row and four uh, changes in the second row, which basically means full resolution or no chroma subsampling. Um, and 440 means full horizontal resolution because we have four samples, but no change between two rows, which means half the vertical resolution. Now, how this saves bandwidth? Well, um, 
The bandwidth factor uh, is computed as the sum of the three numbers divided by 12. So for instance, for uh, chroma subsampling 420, which is the most common one, uh, we get uh, the bandwidth factor 0 0.5. So we basically save half the bandwidth uh, by doing this chroma subsampling, uh, which is used uh, quite often and uh, should not be very perceptible by uh, the human eye. And this brings us to um, the most, uh, most common or um, most famous uh, lossy compression image format JPEG. It's a JPEG standard from 1992, ISO standard. Um, and uh, um, basically, uh, it works with the techniques that I introduced to you right now. It achieves typically 10, point, uh, 10 to 1 compression ratio, which is quite nice. Um, and uh, what it does is that it converts on the RGB image source to YCBCR because it then does the chroma subsampling, the 420 variant. And then uh, the image is split into 8x8 eight eight pixel blocks. And um, those pixel blocks are not uh, color blocks. They are split into each um, of uh, the three components of the Y, C, B and CR um, parts. So the image is split into pixel blocks per, uh, per um, color model component. And then on each of those blocks, discrete cosine transform is done, uh, which is the transformation into the frequency representation of, of those blocks. And then on each block, quantization is done, which is the discarding of the higher frequency functions. Um, and uh, here, uh, the JPEG compression level comes into place, uh, play because um, you can choose how much you want to um, compress your image and the more you, uh, compression you apply, uh, the more uh, frequencies get lost uh, from, uh, from the image. And uh, the result uh, is again uh, the reduced frequency representation of uh, the image and uh, these, uh, these functions then get uh, losslessly compressed. And that's how JPEG compression uh, works. So it's, uh, it's quite simple or um, quite straightforward when you uh, know all the techniques. Um, JPEG, in addition, supports progressive compression. Uh, what it means is that uh, you have two ways of uh, basically streaming the JPEG. When you imagine that you stream the JPEG image over a very slow internet connection, uh, there are two ways how you can see the JPEG image being loaded. Uh, one is um, progressive, uh, which means that first, uh, you see a uh, a blurry image, not detailed one, and then as more and more uh, data gets streamed, um, you get more details in the image. Uh, however, you see the rough image quite fast. On the other hand, when you do not uh, use progressive compression, um, you get the image from the top to the bottom, as you can see on the right hand side uh, of the slide. So this is something uh, that uh, JPEG came with. And if you want to edit uh, raster graphics formats, you can use again the free and open source GIMP, GNU Image Manipulation Program. Or if you uh, want to uh, go the commercial way, you can use Adobe Photoshop or Corel Painter, or there are again many more editors. Uh, you can see Wikipedia for those. Um, before we continue, uh, let me review the lossy versus lossless compression use cases. So you definitely, um, or this corresponds actually with uh, vector graphics. So uh, if you are doing uh, screenshots or drawings uh, and you cannot represent those in vector graphics, which would be ideal, well, screenshots are quite hard to represent in vector graphics. So then, um, then it is best um, to use lossless compression techniques because there are big areas of the same color and um, all the lossless compression techniques work quite well without any degradation in quality. So this means using the now historical PNG format or uh, the WebP or AVIF uh, lossless compression. We will talk about those formats in a little bit. Uh, when you have photographs, then uh, you use lossy compression uh, because there 
uh, it doesn't matter if you lose some of the finer details or finer color changes uh, as we talked about uh, when I explained the JPEG compression. So here JPEG again historical if you want to use an up-to-date format use WebP or AVIF with lossy compression. Now um, there is one more type of uh, raster graphic uh, format that uh, is not based on uh, really based on raster graphics and that's a family of raw formats uh, you may see this um, with professional cameras or some uh, higher end uh, cell phones also that they are able to store besides the jpeg representation of a of a photo photograph they are able to store a raw file now the raw file um, contains the raw sensor uh, data so um, it means how much light basically each pixel of the sensor received and and that's it so it's not viewable as an image right away uh, but uh, you can do all the processing yourself and uh, not rely on what uh, the uh, cell phone software or your camera software does so typically the raw uh, file contains sensor metadata uh, which means which type of sensor actually captured the light then it may contain an image thumbnail uh, so that uh, you don't have to do all the processing to get uh, a preview of uh, what the image actually represents then uh, some image metadata such as the date time location and so on and then the raw optical sensor data which basically means light intensity per pixel and uh, sometimes color but sometimes not it depends on how your uh, how your uh, sensor is uh, is uh, manufactured now the transformations that you need to do with a raw file uh, to get an actual image um, is uh, for instance decoding because uh, some of the raw files are actually encrypted um, then uh, for instance defective pixel removal white balancing noise reduction and so on and so on and finally compression and then what you get is uh, is jpeg if you want to play with raw files um, you can use uh, Darktable, for instance, which again is an open source software. Now, uh, this is an overview of uh, raster and vector graphics and graphics formats uh, for still images. So let's move on to uh, video formats. And if you want to store video, uh, you can again do it uh, in multiple uh, different ways. Um, let's start with the simple approach for instance you may actually uh, represent uh, each video frame as an uncompressed bitmap image that's the most direct approach with the clear disadvantage uh, which is uh, the size of such file but it is quite straightforward and there is a format for instance called r210 by blackmagic design uh, which does just that. Um, it uses 10 bits per color um, to represent an RGB bitmap and then uh, each pixel is padded to 32 bits uh, so that uh, it goes well with the byte boundaries. So 4 bytes per pixel. And you can see how the pixel bit representation uh, looks like and like this you get uh, each frame represented as a bitmap. If we do some math uh, about uh, how big those images then are well we are we have four bytes per pixel which means uh, a full hd image which are two megapixels uh, amounts to eight megabytes um, when we have a 30 frames per second video that's um, already two gigabytes per sec gigabits per second uh, required bandwidth and if we were to uh, to store 8k video at 60 frames per second uh, this amounts to 62 gigabits per second, which is quite a lot. Uh, so this is used uh, in a professional video, when you're shooting a movie maybe, when you really do not want to use any kind of compression and you want every detail just as it is. Another uh, straightforward approach, uh, now with compression and lossy compression that is, uh, is uh, called Motion JPEG from 1992. Um, and basically, it stores uh, each frame as an individual JPEG image. Um, so it's a set of JPEG images 
Typically, it achieves 20 to 1 compression ratio, but it is quite similar to GIF, only with uh, lossy uh, compression. Well, these approaches are, are fine, quite imaginable, but uh, they actually do not uh, take advantage of uh, one fact. Then in a typical video, there are scenes, which are long sequences of consecutive uh, frames, which look quite alike. So there are not many changes uh, between those frames belonging to one scene. And uh, these techniques that we see right now do not take advantage of that. Um, so uh, basically, uh, this uh, could save us a lot of a uh, lot of space if we could take advantage of this fact, and um, this is called interpicture prediction, and it uses two main techniques. One we have already seen, and in video it's called a macro block. Basically, the video frame is split into let's say 16 by 16 pixel blocks. Um, then a chroma subsampling and discrete, co uh, discrete cosine transform is applied, as in JPEG. And uh, here you can see those blocks actually in the image if you look close enough. So uh, the, the frame is uh, split into macro blocks. And then when uh, um, there is another consecutive frame from the same scene, uh, there are motion vectors saying which macro block uh, from the first frame moved where in another frame. So this reduces temporal redundancy because it only captures the changes uh, from one frame to another. And the assumption here is that uh, the changes will be smaller uh, to represent than uh, to represent the entire uh, frame um, from, from, from scratch. So this is macro block and motion vectors. And uh, this is basically uh, the basis of uh, our first video format called uh, H.261. This is actually the first usable video coding standard. Uh, there was one video coding standard before H120, but that uh, proved uh, not being usable. It was developed in uh, 1988 and uh, basically it supported two uh, fixed video frame sizes. and it's you can see from the resolution, those were very small frames, uh, but it was enough for that time. And it was used in video conferencing. So how it looked like, you can see in the screenshot. And it uses a discrete, cos uh, discrete cosine transformation, quantization, and uh, interpicture prediction. And uh, in addition, it uses some deblocking filter to smooth the macro block edges. Um, you, can, you could see the macro blocks in uh, the previous slide, so uh, there was a filter applied to smooth these out. So basically, H261, the first usable video coding standard. And this one is actually interesting uh, for, for another reason, and that is that the techniques used in um, modern video formats um, are the same as in this one. So there was no video format revolution since 1988 when H.261 uh, was introduced. From then, uh, those are evolutions of um, and that, that were going on and uh, that I will show you now, uh, but uh, no revolution. So even today's video formats use the same principles, the same techniques as uh, to uh, H.261. So the next one that came in 1993 was MPEG-1. It was a suite of uh, standards where part two deals with uh, video. Um, and um, as I said, it was evolution, high, uh, support for higher bit rates, higher uh, resolutions, higher bit uh, depth, uh, but um, this was all theoretical. So typically uh, MPEG-1 videos uh, all had the same low resolutions as the H.261 videos. Um, However, MPEG-1 video was used in video CDs. So yes, there were video CDs, um, CD compact discs containing standardized video. And also this format was used for internet video. And what it introduced um, was uh, four different frame types. So um, the first frame type was an iframe or uh, also known as keyframe. 
which could be rendered um, independently of any other frame. Uh, and uh, with this, there is a, a parameter called GOP, group of pictures, which basically says how many frames uh, there are between two iframes or keyframes. So for MPEG-1 video, um, this was um, typically 15 to 18 frames. Then there is a P frame or predicted frame, which only contains the difference from a previous or reference uh, frame. So this is the exploitation of temporal redundancy that uh, we just talked about. Um, then there is the third type, B frame, which is bidirectional frame. And uh, this is similar to P frame. However, it contains difference not only from a previous frame, but also from a following frame. So uh, when decoding a B frame, the decoder actually needs to go all the way to the next I frame uh, so that it can, uh, it can uh, reconstruct uh, the, the, the B frame itself. And then there is a fourth type, uh, D frame, which is specific only to MPEG-1. It was dropped later uh, and uh, it used a low quality uh, DCT uh, to produce basically a low, uh, low quality frame, which could be used, for instance, for seeking in the video. The next uh, video standard came in 1995, and this one is uh, called H.262 or also MPEG-2 uh, video. So uh, H.262 uh, was used for DVD video and also HD DVD and Blu-ray discs uh, at the, the earlier stages and also for TV and HDTV broadcasts, both uh, or, or satellite cable or terrestrial. Those are the DVB-T standards that used uh, MPEG-2 uh, video. Um, there is one feature new in MPEG-2 video and that's support for interlaced video, which was used in TV broadcasts. Basically, it uh, means that uh, the video technically has uh, double the frame rate. However, uh, each frame uh, or one frame, or odd, uh, yeah, one frame contains odd lines of the frame, and uh, another frame contains even lines of the frame, and they are stored separately in separate frames. Uh, so when you reconstruct um, this interlaced video, you deinterlace it, uh, you get half um, the frame rate. Um, so this was supported in uh, MPEG-2 video. Then uh, there was H.263 standard in 1996, and this one actually focused on low bitrate video, so small, small videos. Um, so again, it focuses on conf video conferences, but it is also used in multimedia messaging service. So those are MMS messages um, used uh, in 3G cell phones. And uh, this standard was also based for uh, flash video. Then in uh, 1999 came the MPEG-4 standard, uh, which again in part two contains um, uh, standards for video. However, this was not a significant uh, update over the MPEG-2 video, so um, it uh, never really got any, uh, any real adoption. However, um, there were two famous implementations, DivX and XVID, which were used um, for re-encoding DVD video to be distributed over, over the internet. And uh, the two new features um, here uh, were global motion compensation, which basically meant that uh, you can shift the whole reference frame, not just the macro blocks, and uh, QPA, uh, which basically meant that uh, you could target uh, the motion vectors more precisely. Uh, so uh, yeah, these two features actually uh, were dropped uh, later, or at least the global motion compensation was dropped later because it was uh, costly and it did not improve the overall quality much. Interestingly enough, in the same standard, MPEG-4, in another part, part 10, uh, advanced video coding uh, was uh, specified in 2003. Now, uh, this is actually nowadays the most commonly used video format. Uh, by, uh, or in September 2019 survey, it was used by 91% of video industry developers. 
Uh, it supports uh, up to 8K video and it uh, provides a better compression rate. Um, it is said half bitrate compared to MPEG-2 or MPEG-4 part 2 video. So that's a considerable savings. And uh, also one feature uh, that is introduced in, uh, in AVC is uh, MVC, multi-view video coding, which is support for stereoscopic 3D uh, video. So um, maybe you remember this, there was a time where, um, where consumer TVs uh, had um, support for 3D. So you would sit in front of your TV in your living room with 3D glasses on and uh, you would play the stere stereoscopic 3D or maybe uh, you had a 3D Blu-ray disc uh, which contained uh, video encoded uh, with MPEG-4 MVC. So uh, yeah, this is uh, AVC. And uh, its uh, successor, uh, called HEVC came in 2013 as part of the MPEG-H standard and uh, it offered again better compression rates um, and um, by September 2019 it was used by 43% of video developers. All the standards up to now have one negative feature in common and that is that they are all patented and they are licensed, which means that if you want to create a coder and decoder, a codec uh, using this, uh, these standards, uh, you need to pay uh, a sum, a license fee. Um, this uh, is a problem uh, for some communities. Uh, so open, uh, open formats were developed. Um, in 2008, Ontu Technologies developed uh, an open standard VP8, which is uh, the eighth iteration in a long uh, line of standards. But this one is interesting because in 2010, Google purchased Onto Technologies and released the v VP8 specification as an RFC, as a royalty-free open format. So RFC 6386 uh, from 2011 uh, specifies how to encode video in uh, VP8. And this uh, codec uh, or this, uh, this format was uh, used in HTML video as a replacement for GIF for simple and short animations. And in 2013, Google replaced it with VP9, which is a direct successor. And uh, VP9 is used uh, in YouTube videos um, up to today, and it competes with HEVC in uh, compression rates. So it would seem that uh, these, uh, these are the top video formats. It's not true because uh, if you take a look uh, at the years of release, those are actually already quite old. So uh, from 2013, which means last decade. Um, so in this decade, in 2018, an alliance for open media was established and they produced uh, a video for format AV1 uh, which is a open and royalty free. Uh, it's based on VP9 and uh, Facebook actually tested it in 2018 and it offers better compression ratios than VP9 uh, and better compression ratios than H264 and actually it competes with HEVC. And uh, this format is nowadays used by YouTube for 8K videos and uh, I've seen it used also for some 4K videos. So uh, if uh, on YouTube you, for instance, uh, open the stats for nerds that they have there, you'll see uh, that they use a VP9 and AV1 um, for, for videos. Um, so this, uh, this AV1 format actually gains popularity nowadays. Uh, the problem is that uh, the encoders and the software-based encoders are quite slow. Uh, so it takes a long time to encode a video in AV1 nowadays, but that might might get better in in future. Um, and this is not all. The uh, the licensed and uh, royalty full uh, camp does uh, does not sleep. And uh, in 2020, they introduced um, H.266 versatile video coding uh, as part of the MPEG I standard. And uh, this is a direct successor to HEVC and uh, it has some cool new features such as 
support for 16K resolution, 16 bits per color, uh, other chroma subsampling ratios, um, variable and fractional frame rates, and uh, 360 degree video uh, support. And it is expected to have a 30 to 50% better compression rate compared to HEVC. The status of H.266 nowadays is that uh, the specification is final and there is um, some initial implementation, uh, but an open source implementation is still uh, under development. Uh, so it is, uh, it is not uh, really possible to um, get uh, your hands on a free H.266 encoder at the moment. Now, uh, these video formats um, have one uh, interesting consequence, and that is that uh, modern uh, still image formats are based on uh, those video formats, uh, specifically uh, based on the iframe or keyframe encoding. So, uh, for instance, uh, WebP is uh, a open format successor to GIF, PNG and JPEG. Um, and it was introduced by Google in 2010, and it is based on VP8 uh, keyframe encoding. It supports both lossless and lossy compression, and uh, nowadays it's supported in 93% of web browsers. So actually, uh, if you are going to um, include graphics uh, on a web page nowadays, you should not use PNG and JPEG. You should use uh, WebP um, uh, and uh, that is in uh, either lossless or lossy uh, variant. And there are other formats based on the other um, modern video for formats. Um, for instance, in th um, 2015, uh, high efficiency image file format was introduced. That's actually a container which contains either HEIC images based on HEVC iframes or even AVIF images based on AV1 um, encoding. And uh, AV1 is supported in major web browsers, uh, so it is a successor to WebP. Um, and it is um, about 50% smaller than uh, JPEG. And there is a link from the slide to a comparison, quite extensive comparison, done by Netflix in 2020. So uh, have a look um, there. Okay, so, uh, so that we can talk about multimedia, uh, we also need to talk about uh, audio formats. So far we talked about images and videos, but let's take a look at how digital audio is actually represented and which uh, data formats are there for digital audio. So uh, first, let's take a look at how digital audio is represented. Uh, the digital audio representation is based on pulse code modulation, more precisely, or more commonly, the linear pulse code modulation. And um, there are basically two steps to representing audio. First, the analog signal amplitude is sampled at regular intervals. This is the sampling rate or sampling frequency. And uh, the measured uh, amplitude, um, or the, yeah, the measured amplitude is quantized because uh, it may be uh, an arbitrary number what is measured. Uh, however, um, digital audio also has its bit depth, the same as, uh, the same as uh, uh, graphics, which means that there are distinct steps that the signal, um, the signal can have. So uh, if we measure uh, an analog amplitude, it needs to be represented as the nearest digital step available. And the number of steps, again, is uh, the bit depth, uh, similar to the number of colors uh, with images. So two uh, major uh, parameters of digital audio, sampling rate and bit depth. And uh, the linear pulse code modu modulation uh, is different from the regular one because uh, the quantization steps are linearly uniform. However, this one is the one commonly used. And with these techniques, uh, you can uh, represent uh, audio in a waveform audio file format developed by IBM and Microsoft in 1991. It's a typical format for uncompressed audio, although it also supports uh, audio compression. Uh, but that's not, uh, that's not its typically use, use case. 
So uh, when you represent an audio in a uh, WAF uh, file, uh, you specify the frequency, the bit depth, the number of channels, and then you represent the measured uh, measured samples. Uh, there are some uh, examples of uh, bit rate and one minute uh, file size. So you can see that, for instance, 44 kilohertz frequency, 16 bit bit depth, and two channels. Um, one minute size of uh, such an audio file has approximately nine megabytes. And that is coincidentally the uh, same um, specification uh, that is used for compact disc digital audio, so um, the, the regular audio CD. However, there is another format used for that uh, called a red book format. Nevertheless, it uses LPCM uh, at 44 kilohertz, 16 bits and two channels. So also the, the audio size per minute um, or the bit rate in kilobytes per second is the same. Okay, so this is uncompressed audio. So again, uh, we want to save some space. So we are going to talk about compression. And first, we are going to talk about lossless compression. And for lossless audio, there is the FLAC uh, file format developed in 2001 by Ziff Org Foundation, and it achieves about 50% compression rate. Uh, it actually tries to represent uh, the sound wave as a um, function, and uh, the difference from the value of that function uh, and the real signal is uh, called an error. So basically, it tries to represent uh, the sound wave as a function plus the error difference uh, from uh, from that function. It also uses run length encoding for, for instance, silent passages. And uh, it uses the fact that uh, with multi-channel audio, most of the audio is typically the same for all channels and there are only small differences. So uh, the, the, the common audio is represented uh, in one channel and then for each additional channel, there is only the difference uh, represented. So like this, um, the audio can be losslessly compressed using FLAC. And uh, next, we are going to talk about lossy compression. So for lossy compression, the most uh, famous uh, format is MP3, which actually is specified as part of the MPEG-1 and MPEG-2 standards. Um, it was specified by the Fraunhofer Society in 1993. And uh, it, again, is based on um, the discrete cosine transform. Uh, and it uh, again compresses the audio by shedding uh, some of the unperceivable frequencies in, in the sound. This is based on psychoacoustic analysis. Basically, they took uh, a few people and uh, they tested uh, what people can hear and what people cannot hear. And then the frequencies that the people uh, could not hear uh, got uh, discarded. And um, this results in approximately 5% the size of CD audio, which at that time meant that uh, songs could be shared over the internet. Um, at that time, uh, internet connection speeds were nowhere near the speeds necessary for CD audio sharing, but MP3 made it possible to actually share audio over the internet at that time. And also MP3 supports the joint stereo encoding, which again uh, means that uh, you have the main channel uh, and then the side channel actually specifies the difference of the left and right channel. So in MP3, uh, you, have, uh, um, you have support for this joint stereo encoding. And the direct successor to MP3 uh, was AAC, Advanced Audio Coding, specified both in uh, the MPEG-2 and MPEG-4 standards in 1997. And again, it's not a revolution, rather an evolution. So uh, it builds upon MP3 and adds some more flexibility, some more uh, processing complexity, resulting in better compression rates. But again, these, since they are both parts of the MPEG uh, standard suite, they are patent patented and uh, licensed to codec manufacturers, uh, which again is a problem, it's, it is costly, so there is an open alternative called Opus, uh, again developed by Ziff Org Foundation in 2012. 
and it is an open format. What's interesting about Opus is that it ranked higher quality than any other standard audio format at any bitrate, which means that uh, you could uh, you could have AAC or, or MP3 at any bitrate you want, but still it was worse than what Opus could, could achieve in the test. Um, interesting use case, Opus is used by WhatsApp and Signal for audio messages. Right, so now we have talked about um, formats for uh, images, audio and video. Um, what is missing so that we could really talk about multimedia is um, a talk about containers, uh, which would allow us to actually interleave the video and audio streams with maybe other streams like subtitles and chapter information, and which would allow us to uh, play these in a synchronized matter um, so that we could actually stream both video and audio and uh, keep it synchronized. So uh, for that, we need uh, something called a multimedia container format, which allows just that, allows storing the audio and video streams and interleaving those so that uh, we can, for instance, stream them. Um, there are simple containers uh, focused, for instance, on one uh, type of uh, media, such as JPEG, PNG, and uh, the WAV uh, file format. Those are actually containers, but they are to be used with simple, uh, with single uh, data type only, uh, such as JPEG image, PNG image, or uh, WAV data. And then there are flexible containers, uh, which are patented and licensed. So you need to pay uh, if you uh, develop a software that creates uh, data in those containers. And those come with the MPEG standards. So for MPEG 1, 2 and 4, there are uh, different uh, container standards. Other than that, there are again flexible containers which are open and royalty free. The most popular one is called Matroska and it has a subset, a WebM, uh, which we will talk about uh, next. And also, uh, although now it's historical, and there is the OG container. Now, Matroska from 2002 is an open container format and is quite popular on the internet nowadays. So uh, if, you, uh, if you are sharing videos, uh, they are typically in the uh, Matroska container. Uh, WebM is a subset of Matroska uh, developed by Google in 2010. And basically it limits the usable formats in the container and it limits uh, the formats to the open ones. So whatever is represented in WebM uh, is always an open format. For video, it's VP8, VP9, and AV1. For audio, it's uh, Vorbis, which is a predecessor to Opus and Opus. So those are uh, multimedia container formats, which allow you to mix audio, video, and other streams and play them synchronously. The last media we haven't touched in this lecture is uh, print. And uh, interestingly enough, all the print focus focused formats are based on one, uh, one specific format called PostScript. And PostScript is actually a programming language and it is a printer programming language. Uh, and its first version is from 1984. If you take a look at the example of PostScript, uh, you will see that it really is a program um, focused on printers. It's written in a reverse Polish notation, which means that the arguments go first and the function name goes last. So in this example, the courier font is selected, then uh, the size of the font is selected, then the printer gets moved to coordinates, and there it prints out the hello world text. So this is a um, postscript. Um, of course, it's much more complex. This is a really, really simple hello world example, but you can get the idea how postscript works. This program gets sent to a printer and the printer executes the program and the result is uh, that a page is, uh, is printed. There is the encapsulated PostScript format, which is again PostScript, but 
it has a bitmap preview encapsulated. Uh, this is because if you wanted to see what is represented in a PostScript file, you would have to run the entire program and simulate the printer to be able to see what is inside, uh, which is uh, resource intensive. And that's why encapsulated PostScript has uh, a bitmap preview so that if you want to just see what is in the preview, uh, what is in the file, you can see the preview. And if you want to print it in a full quality, you send the PostScript PostScript program to, to the printer. Um, then in 1993, Adobe introduced the portable document format PDF, which I believe all of you already know. Um, it is based on PostScript. However, it has no global state, which means that each PDF page is independent of the others and can be rendered independently, which is a huge advantage because with PostScript files, if you want to see what is on the last page, you need to run the entire program that prints all the pages before until you finally arrive at the last page. With PDF, you don't have to do that. Each page is uh, independent of the others. And a uh, PDF file represents a complete description of a document, which contains all the included artifacts, such as texts, fonts, vector graphics, raster graphics, and uh, associated metadata. But that's not all. A PDF file can also contain form fields, which you can fill in, 3D graphics, videos, digital signatures, attachments, so data files, and it supports ECMAScript. So you can also do some transformation of uh, what is in the PDF file using ECMAScript. And you can also encrypt your PDF file so that, for instance, it can be only opened with a password. Now, a variant of PDF is PDF-A. It is meant for long-term preservation. It is defined by its own ISO standard. And basically, it is a subset of PDF uh, which prohibits some features unsuitable for long-term archival. So for instance, you cannot link any external fonts from a PDF-A file. Uh, you cannot include audio, video, you cannot encrypt the file, and you cannot include ECMAScript in, in your file. For PDF-A, there is a converter online, a validator online. Uh, in the screenshot, you can see uh, a screenshot from uh, Microsoft Word, where you can save your Word document as a PDF-A file if you check the PDF-A compliant checkbox. Uh, there are uh, multiple versions of PDF-A, which basically follow uh, the evolution of the PDF file format itself. And uh, there are additional variants of PDF um, tweaked towards specific use cases. For instance, PDFX um, focuses on reliable print data exchange. PDF uh, UA uh, focuses on universal accessibility, which means accessibility to people with disabilities and their assistive technologies. PDF VT is based on uh, marketing and uh, invoices and basically it allows you to uh, to have a pdf document where some of the parts are changed quite often um, and uh, yeah so those are invoices or marketing documents and then a pdf e is based on engineering documents and has a special support for 3d objects for instance and when talking about pdf uh, and uh, print focused data formats. I have to mention uh, the AI file format, which is proprietary file format used by Adobe Illustrator, which is a commercial, um, commercial program for creating uh, vector graphics, for instance. And uh, the AI format is based on EPS in its first versions and on PDF in its, uh, in its later versions. Uh, when you are saving an AI file, uh, you can explicitly save it with PDF compatibility and then any PDF viewer should be able to view also the AI file. So this was the multimedia and print file formats overview.